Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to your Bible Questions Answered. I'm your host, Dr. Douglas Hamp. Excited to be with you again. Again, we're going to Israel in 2024, so do go to thewakecongregation.com to check that out. And also, big shout out to the patrons. Thank you so much for uh, supporting this ministry. It means a lot. It really helps. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Doug Hamp if you want to be part of that. And you can give whatever you want to give. Thank you so much. I just love it and appreciate it. So thank you, guys. Without further ado, why don't we get into uh, today's uh, questions? There's a lot of great questions I'm looking forward to uh, answering. Okay, so this is um, this is from Diana. She says, regarding the heretical belief in Lilith, the alleged first wife of Adam, is this based on an actual entity, Inanna Astarte Ashtot? Or something like that. So, Diana, this idea of Lilith comes from the rabbis. So, this is a very, quite a late idea. All right. Now, the word Lilith actually comes from the word Lila, which means night. And so, the basic idea here is that this goddess would come at night. She would somehow entice men. It probably is rooted in the idea of a man, uh, you know, having some kind of a sexual dream or a wet dream or something like that. And that's perhaps where they got that idea. All right. Um, I don't know that there's any particular goddess named Lily, but I believe that is where they got the inspiration uh, is based on the night. Now, is there a correlation? Could there be a correlation to Astarte or Nana? It's possible. But I have not uh, delved into that to see if there actually is a historical connection between those two. But I think it's fair enough to say that, yeah, there must be some kind of a thematic uh, correlation. And so I don't uh, I don't fault the rabbis for that. But I do think they they kind of invented something that really isn't. Well, it's not well uh, established in Scripture, in my opinion. OK, so uh, thank you for that. Good question. Uh, this is from Chad. He says, if we pray in a state of unclear. Uh, cleanliness, do you think our prayers are heard? Well, Chad, I, I think we probably want to clarify what you mean by unclean. Um, you know, so if you have a nocturnal emission or if you have a flow of blood, um, if you've touched a dead carcass, I don't think that there's any issue whatsoever with your prayers being heard. All right. I I just don't think that's the case. Uh, we even see this when there were people who were unclean, uh, such as the lepers and the woman with the flow of blood. Um, even the woman in uh, Syria, Phoenicia, right, that was unclean because of who she was. All these people were able to communicate with Jesus and he did not turn them away. In fact, he said, your faith has made you well. So unclean just means that there's some bodily fluid, typically, there's some bodily fluid or there's some uh, biological reason that would make you unclean. That's really what it is. Now, if we're talking about moral issues, right, if you've murdered somebody, uh, if you've stolen or, you know, name your sin, and then you just think, oh, I'm just going to pray to the Lord and it'll be no problem. Well, yeah, then there's going to be an issue unless it's a prayer of repentance, uh, true repentance, of course. So I would suggest that if it's a moral issue, it's a moral unclean issue, morally unclean issue, then, yeah, you want to get that sorted out. If it's a physically unclean issue and really when we're talking about unclean, that's what the Bible's talking about is being unclean physically. All right. Now, that could have been caused, it could have been, been caused by some kind of a, a moral issue, then you want to take care of that moral issue, okay? So I, I think there's there's two different things, all right? Uh, another question from Chad. So if you believe that seat seat are, are, uh, are for our prayer shawls, but a prayer shawl is not outlined in Scripture, I'm confused on your belief, why do you think we need to wear them? Um, so... Chad, uh, I don't, I do not personally think that we need to wear tzitzit. Okay, so this is from uh, Deuteronomy 22. Let's take a look at this. All right, so it says, you shall make tassels on the four corners of the clothing with which you cover yourself. All right, so the basic idea here is that you have a piece of clothing 
that has four corners, all right? So I think that is a, a very valid way to interpret it, all right? That's how I'm interpreting, okay? So obviously, I think it's valid, all right? Now, obviously, I understand that many people interpret that differently, and I'm sensitive to that, and I'm certainly not trying to cause any waves because I want to encourage people in their uh, interpretation of uh, of what that is saying. I do not personally think that we need to put tzitziot uh, on the outside of our belt buckles or anything like that. Uh, I do believe this is talking about a four-cornered piece of clothing. All right. So you shall make tassels on the four corners of the clothing with which you cover yourself. Right. So it's it's something that has four corners. I don't wear anything that has four corners. Right. So that's how I'm interpreting that. And it's just to answer your question, that that's how I that's how I interpret that. OK, so I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit sensitive here because I know there's a lot of different opinions about this. I know people um, have, uh, you know, a, a, a claim, a stake in this. And I'm not trying to tell people to go one way or the other. But I can tell you the way I'm in, I'm reading it and how I interpret that. And obviously, my actions are based on how I'm interpreting that. And so this is how I actually see that that uh, I don't wear a piece of four-cornered four -cornered, uh, clothing, all right? So then the idea here is that this is what you use to cover yourself. Well, when would you cover yourself? Well, presumably in prayer, okay? So, um, and why? Because we see here, let's go back. Again, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners, there you go, again, on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners and you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it remember all the commandments of the lord to do them and that you may not follow the heart of tree to which your own heart and your own eyes have in, are inclined and that you may remember to do all the commandments and be holy for your god all right so the the whole point of the tassels is for me to remember they're not to necessarily be an outward sign to other people right and it's interesting because when uh, Jesus was confronted with this same thing right here in Matthew 23, 5, here speaking about the uh, Pharisees. He says, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. All right. So they would put on these tassels so that others could see how holy and righteous and good they were. And Jesus uh, really takes them to task for that, right? So again, I have nothing against wearing tassels. And if people feel convicted to do that, I support them 100%. But I do not interpret it that way that I need to put tassels on my belt buckle loops or whatever and uh, and, and go from there. So I hope that makes uh, sense to you. Um, I'll have to leave that one there, okay? So very good. Let me get to another question um okay let's see okay i guess i don't all right so this is from bobby can you explain the new testament indwelling of the holy spirit doctrine and provide scriptures to back it i'm struggling with the idea that the old testament believers had the spirit descend on them and empower them temporarily but new testament believers simply have it residing in them full time Bobby, it's a fantastic question. In fact, this is something that I really wrestled with as well. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull up uh, a presentation I did from my first book, Corrupting the Image, uh, Volume 1. So if anybody is interested in that, I, of course, would encourage you to check that out. You can get that on Amazon uh, or in a number of different places. Hold on. Let me make sure my slideshow is set up properly. And then we will... Go for it. Okay, there we go. So um, I'm talking here about the spirit of God in Adam. All right, so in the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. All right, so Genesis 2, 7, what is it that he's breathing into him? Well, I'd say he's breathing the Holy Spirit into him, right? God breathed into Adam. We see that animals also have breath in their lungs, but God did not breathe into them. Right. So Adam was made up of physical, earthly stuff. And also he had a immaterial soulish or spirit 
kind of thing here as well. Now, I argue uh, this isn't exactly germane to your question, but I argue that we really we have uh, we're both body and soul and or spirit. I think we're kind of the same thing. Um, it, it's really neither here nor there, but I just a few scriptures to show you. Uh, his, his spirit was troubled. My soul is cast down within me. They seem to be the same thing, maybe just two different perspectives of the same immaterial part of you uh, is what I would probably suggest. Now was my soul troubled, said Jesus, right? Um, now he was troubled in the spirit. It seems to be that Jesus in the book of John is troubled in soul. He's troubled in spirit. They seem to be the same exact thing. And then he gave up his soul. I mean, okay, his psuche, right? That's the Greek word there. He yielded up his spirit. Again, this seems to be relatively the same thing. And then Jesus says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body and health. So it really seems that we have two parts. We've got this immaterial, call it soul, call it spirit, probably the same thing in my opinion, and we have a body. Uh, we've got the spirits of men, we see the souls of the men under the altar, all these different things here, okay? So again, I'm not trying to get into that part, but what I wanna show you here is that God created when he breathed into Adam and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed vayipach, into his nostrils the breath of life, right? So chayim, nishmat chayim, my Hebrew is backwards there, and man became a living soul, okay? So God himself did the breathing. Uh, again, he didn't breathe into the animals. I've already explained that for you. But when Jesus uh, after his resurrection, it says that when he had said this, he breathed, he in-breathed, and if an and he breathed into, or in-breathed into, you will, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, that's the same Greek word that we have in Genesis 2-7, right? So that uh, it's the same thing that's being used there, which tells me that Jesus breathing into the disciples and God breathing into Adam is the same thing, all right? So what that means is that Adam had the Holy Spirit in him before the fall. And I think that really is the clincher in my opinion. Adam had the Holy Spirit living in him before the fall. All right, so if you can grasp that, then I think this other stuff makes sense. So what happened then? Adam has the Holy Spirit, he then sins, and God says, the day that you do this, and the day you do this, you're going to die. Now, did he die that day? Well, kind of, right? His body began to die. He didn't give up the ghost, as it were, for 930 years. But what happened to him? The connection that he had with God was severed. And I would argue that what happened is he lost the Holy Spirit. He lost the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And mankind would not get that back for roughly 4,000 years, depending on how you want to look at that. All right, so now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Holy Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So it was the intention to give the Spirit, but it had not yet happened. All right, so when, when the Spirit comes in, in, that's the same thing that Adam had, but we also have this Spirit coming on, this kind of experience. It's the Greek word epi, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit had come upon you. Uh, and numbers, this is the same exact, um, it's the same exact uh, experience that they had in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as what they had in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit coming upon them. Then the Lord came down and took of the spirit that was upon him, upon Moses, and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened that when the spirit rested upon them, that they prophesied. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, right? All these different examples, right? So we have two experiences. There's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which Adam had, and then New Testament believers have. And then there's also the upon experience, which is what people in the Old Testament had and people in the New Testament can have, okay? So both of those were uh, were extant uh, in, in both Testaments, okay? It, it happened in the Old Testament, it happened in the New Testament. The difference is 
for most of human history, mankind, the sons of Adam, and I mean that very literally, the sons of Adam did not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them until Jesus. Okay, so you had Adam had the Holy Spirit and probably Eve as well. Right. And then they lost it. And then roughly 4,000 years go by. And then mankind has the opportunity to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him once again, thanks to what Jesus did. Right. And that restores that that spiritual connection with the Lord. So that is how I would put those together. It's a fantastic question. Uh, it's one of those things that bothered me as well. Uh, so I hope that uh, hope that helps you a little bit. OK, this is from uh, Taryn. Pastor Doug, what are your thoughts on the Pope and the rewriting of the Ten Commandments? Does this have any biblical message for us? So, uh, Taryn, it really doesn't. Um, you know, last week I, I addressed this briefly. I had not done uh, too much research on it, but I, I did look things up. Nothing happened. OK, so the Pope is not at all replacing the Ten Commandments. What happened is there's somebody out there who made a video saying that, you know, the Pope is now giving us 10 new commandments, but that's not that's not the case, right? And this is where we need to be very careful, very vigilant as Christians, because, uh, look, I make videos as well, okay? And I understand the whole lure of uh, clickbait, right? You want to get people to click your video, right? That's what happens. And a lot of times people make videos that are not eh, entirely honest uh, to get people to click it, all right? And now, whether they did this intentionally or they just didn't do their research, I'm not sure, but this is what's happening. Now, did the Pope talk about the Ten Commandments of, you know, of the environment? Yes, he did. But he's not saying, what he's not saying, this is important, what he's not saying is that these are replacing the Ten Commandments. Now, look, uh, I, I would argue that it was probably irresponsible of a religious figure like the Pope to start talking about Ten Commandments of taking care of the planet. I think that was irresponsible, but he's not suggesting that the Ten Commandments of the Bible are no longer valid. All right, that just isn't the case. Um, but if you think about it, in our 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 vernacular, we talk about you know the Bible for salespeople, right? It's the salesperson's Bible. Uh, it's the health nut Bible, right? And they're not saying that it's now the Bible and it's taking the place of this Bible that we have called the Old Testament, New Testament, nobody's saying that. It's just this becomes now an authoritative document that people might use for weight gain or weight loss, right? Or for, you know, beating cancer or whatever they're into, that becomes their quote unquote Bible. Okay. And that's what the Pope is referring to is, you know, we should take care of the planet. And here's 10 commandments for taking care of the planet. Again, I think it's irresponsible for a man in his position to talk about 10 commandments because it can give people the wrong impression. But I also think the person that made the video uh, was not being exactly forthright uh, in making that video because it, it causes some, some confusion and a bit of consternation. <laughs> okay, uh, this, is, this is from Maria. Maria says, uh, what do you think about wearing a seat seat uh, for male and females, also any opinion in head coverings for the female. So Maria, I did answer the tzitziot uh, question already. Uh, I don't see any reason that women can't do it if they want to. Again, I don't, but I don't also, I also don't see a uh, commandment saying that we need to put those on our, um, on our, you know, jeans, you know, and our belt and all this different stuff. I really do believe that the prayer shawl, the the, um, the prayer shawl answers that because it's a four cornered garment. That's how I interpret it. All right. Now, as far as uh, head coverings for the female, uh, if you look there in Second uh, Corinthians, I think it's ten. Uh, no, First Corinthians eleven, where Paul is talking about that. Right. He talks about how a woman should have her head covered. Now, is he talking about authority? Quite possibly, right? Um, you know, that you got the father and then Jesus is under authority of the father, and then the man is under the authority of Jesus, and then the woman's under the authority of the man. All right. But then he also goes on to talk about hair, and he talks about um how the hair is the covering. And that's how I interpret that. That hair is a perfectly good covering for the woman. So I am not of the opinion. 
that that a woman needs to wear anything besides that when she's praying. Again, if a woman decides that she wants to do that, I respect that decision, but I, I'm not convinced that that is what scripture is teaching us to do. All right, this is from Ec Legacy. Legacy is the Antichrist and a false prophet. Will they show up at the same time? Or is the Antichrist going to show up first, then die, then the false prophet sets up and mandates worship of the Antichrist image? Well, uh, Legacy, we're not told exactly. Now, the first instance that we really have of these two, of course, is uh, in the book of Revelation. So let's take a look at that. Let me bring back my scripture here. One second. I'm just bringing back the scripture. Okay. So we're going to go to the book of Revelation chapter 13. All right. So the first one we see coming up in the book of Revelation is, in fact, the beast. Okay. So that would suggest that he's the first to come on the scene. And then we're just told about another one that comes up out of the earth, and he's got two horns. He's like the dragon, uh, you know, and he's like uh, he's like the beast. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So clearly the, the more important of these two is the beast. And then the second beast, also known as the false prophet, uh, he's significant as well. We're not given a lot of details as to exactly when they come up, you know, entirely what they're going to do. We, we, we have just a, a little bit of what's going on here. But we do have in Revelation chapter 19, we're told about them again. Then the beast was captured and with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two are cast alive in a lake of fire burning with brimstone, right? So this is where we really get a, a clear picture or a clear designation of the false prophet, okay? And also in Revelation 16, 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming up out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, okay? So these are it. These are pretty much the three places where these three people are, are, are mentioned. Well, Satan not being person, but um, entities, okay? And then you have the beast and then the false prophet or also known as the second beast. So we're, we're just not told exactly how that's going to happen. Um, so I'm writing a book. Uh, it's, a, it's a work of fiction, okay, just to be clear. And I'm trying to put all of this end time stuff, all that I've done in Corrupting Image 1, 2, and 3, into a really fun and uh, as biblically accurate scenario as possible uh, in, in this book, in this uh, fiction book. All right. So, oh, I'm really working on getting, I was working on it today. I'm trying to get it done. All right. So uh, I, in, in my book, I have them, you know, existing for quite a while. And, but one rises up into prominence and then he basically hires the other guy to work with him, but they both have a very similar uh, vision of what's going to happen. All right. So again, that's fiction, right? I, I can't entirely defend everything from scripture because, you know, it is what it is. It's a novel, but it's certainly inspired by the real events that are described in the Bible. Uh, you know, how accurate I am, we'll have to wait and see, right? Uh, and I hope not to be here when all of this goes down. All right. Thank you. For a good question. All right, another question from like Legacy. During your Bible questions answered show last week, you alluded to that the tares would be separated from the wheat first. Could this be a false rapture that occurs that takes unbelievers first? When this happens, believers could be up in arms. Uh, question mark there. Well, um, I mean, yeah, a lot of things can happen, and it's very difficult for us to say what's going to happen, right? I can certainly speculate and say, yeah, this is probably what's going to happen, but I don't know. Okay. So based on what uh, people like Barbara Marcianak have talked about, uh, that when the ascended masters come, they're going to take people whose consciousness has not, not been keeping up. They're going to take them away. Uh, you know, could that be a, a reference to the terrorists being taken first? 
Probably not. Okay. Because look, when this happens is the time that Jesus comes back. Okay. And who is going to be taking the tares? The angels. And where do they go? To the bad place. Okay. So I don't think that you're going to have any kind of a false rapture scenario. Now we could have maybe predictions of a false rapture scenario, but I don't think we're going to actually have the real thing. In other words, we can't have a, a an actual staged event. I'm not even sure how to put that. But when the terrors are taken away, that's it, right? That's the end of it. And that is at the return of Jesus. So I'm not sure how else to put that for you uh, without tying myself up in a knot here trying to explain it. Okay. All right. So this is from Diana. Will the lake of fire be a place of everlasting torment or a quick and final extinguishing with only the smoke being eternal. I ask because what incentive does the reprobate have to repent if they have only to fear a quick and final death? Wow, uh, there's a lot in that. And uh, to be fair, uh, I'm not going to do that a lot of justice right here and now. But I think there, there's definitely some things to consider as we're looking at this passage. Uh, or at, the, at this question. So let's take a look here at Revelation chapter 14. And this is where we get the harshest description of what is going to happen uh, to people. All right, so then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. All right, so this is the harshest description of what is going to happen to people. But did you notice that it says that anyone who takes the mark is worships his image and worships the beast. That's what has to happen for someone to get the full cup of God's wrath, right? God's wrath poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation only will happen to those who worship the beast, worship his image, and take the mark of the beast. So if you haven't done that, you don't get 100% of God's torment right so that's very very important now there are a number of other places where um and i'm trying to think where it is uh i did a whole presentation on this <laughs> and uh let me think about this for a second because um in there give me one second i can pull this up all right, I went through Revelation, and I took a long time to uh, explain that. Very cool. I found the presentation. So let me pull this up for you guys, because there I have all my notes, and I don't have to try to uh, think on my feet, which makes life a lot easier. It's kind of cool. All right, hold on. Let me set up my slideshow again. Oh, come on. What's going on? There we go. Set up slideshow, and I got it. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, we are told, I explained all about Tophet. Of course, that was very interesting. So um, let me see here. Okay, so the wicked are going to be turned into hell. All right, so here we go. All right, I want to make sure you guys can see that. Yes, you can. Good. All right, so he says, this is Deuteronomy 32, my fire is kindled in my anger, and shall burn to the lowest hell, or Sheol, right? It shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. The wicked shall be turned into Sheol, and all the nations that forget God. Let death seize them, let them go down alive into Sheol, for wickedness is in their dwellings, and among them, if I send into heaven, you are there, etc. Okay, so uh, a few more things to consider. Um... Let's see here. I'm getting to that. So, um, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they are in the same way as these indulge in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example of 
in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So notice that the fire itself is a thing that is eternal, right? God's fire is eternal. We see this in uh, Leviticus 10, right? So Nadav and Abihu, they get torched by God because God's fire is eternal. And Daniel, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him because his, his fire is eternal. And uh, sadly, I'm missing the actual passage I was kind of looking for. Oh, here we go. Is this it? No, that's not it. Bummer. Um, that is such a drag because I know it's right there. Uh, let's see here. I'm looking. Isn't that a... Yeah. Okay. So Isaiah... Uh, almost there. Goodness. It's driving me nuts now. Okay. Well, I hope you hate that. Can't find it. All right. So the fire is going to test everyone. God's fire is that part that is eternal. All right. We see this in um, Isaiah 33 that uh, who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Why? Because it's God's fire. We see this in Isaiah 66. His rebuke with flames of fire. Same thing in 2 Thessalonians 1. The Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. So it's God's fire that is eternal, right? That's the thing that doesn't ever go out is his fire. The whole idea of there being a, a specific place known as hell is, I think, somewhat of a misnomer. Okay, and let me share another passage this is from uh, 2 Thessalonians, or yeah, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's a really important passage because in there, notice here that he's going to, Jesus is coming in flaming fire. He's going to take vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So I know a lot of people come to this and they say, well, you see, they're going to be sent away from, they're going to, you know, be taken to a different place. And that's where they're going to be destroyed forever. But I think it's really a misreading of that. They're going to be destroyed on account of the presence of the Lord, right? Because notice here, Jesus is coming in flaming fire, right? So the fire is from the Lord Jesus. And they're going to be destroyed with everlasting destruction. That's from the Lord. And not apart from, not away from, but because of the presence of the Lord. Right? And this word here, from, is in the Greek is the word apple. And it can mean on account of or away from. So that's uh, what the away from is the ablative. Right? That's, that's over there versus by virtue of. And we use this in English as well. When you say that, you know, so-and-so died from smoke inhalation, he died from cancer, he died of or died from whatever it may be. And that's the same, the same usage of that, of that word there. All right. So um, I, I hope I, I hope I got most of your points. Again, there's a lot more that I could say there. But the one thing that uh, I do want to just add or to add here is that you're saying what incentive does the reprobate have to repent if they only have to fear a quick and final death? Well, I, I think that's probably the wrong question. You know, if people are just repenting so they don't go to hell, it's kind of a bummer. Um, the, the joy of living with the Lord forever and ever is really awesome. Okay. You're going to have you know, pleasures at his right hand forevermore. So hopefully there's something drawing people to the Lord um, versus, you know, just trying to get out of hell. Um, boy, there's a lot more I could say about that. I'm going to leave it there for now because this is a whole uh, gigantic theological can of worms and I'm not ready to open the entire thing at the moment. Okay, let me get to the next question. This is from Sean. Along with that, what was asked above me, I understand it as eternal destruction, no coming back from this type of thing. Thoughts? Yeah, Sean, I, I'm definitely uh, gravitating in that direction that, um, you know, if you're, if you're destroyed forever, but you're not being destroyed forever, there's a huge difference. Uh, I just don't see that God is going to destroy people and they're going to consciously suffer. That's how I was raised, is that, you know, they're, they're hating it forever and ever. But the passages that are used, and again, I wasn't going to get into all of this, but um, is Isaiah 66, where he talks about the cadavers, the bodies, 
uh, the corpses of the men who transgressed against me, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The, the people, uh, the, the bodies are the things that are being consumed by these worms that don't die. And the fire that's not quenched, it's, it's God's fire that we're actually talking about, not necessarily the fires of hell as, you know, and hell is such a, an unfortunate word because it has a lot, it's used for a lot of different things in scripture. And so it causes a lot of confusion. All right, this is from Carol. All right, at funerals, John 14, 1 through 3 is often quoted. Is this saying when we die, we go immediately to heaven or that we sleep until Jesus comes back at the resurrection? I tend to think the Bible teaches the later or the latter, but this verse teaches both, so I'm confused. Huh. Well, yeah, I, I don't really think that it, it necessarily teaches both, Carol, but let's take a look at it. All right, so John 14, and I'll bring it up on my screen so you all can take a look with me. All right, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. All right, so look. Certainly, there are, there are places in, in God's kingdom that he has in store for us. And he says he's going to go and prepare a place, and he's going to come back and receive us. So he hasn't come back yet. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the moment you die, that you're automatically in that place that he's preparing for us. He's going to come back and receive us. It's not that we die and we automatically go there. right? So that's definitely a, a misnomer. Now, I'm of the opinion that we probably are sleeping until that final day. And I've been asked this question many times, and I think that you can make a pretty decent argument for either we're with him right now or we're sleeping until the resurrection. I take the latter, that we are sleeping until the resurrection. Again, I understand people that argue it the other way, and I see their points, but I think you have both of these in Scripture, and you have to look at them both and accept them both. And even if we look in Revelation chapter six, where it talks about those souls uh, who had been martyred for their faith, probably during the tribulation, I mean, it definitely says during the tribulation, but where are they? They're under the altar and they're saying, how much longer? And just a little bit longer. And then you'll get this new robe, which is some kind of a, a, a you know, they're being robed, they're, they're being given a body of some sort. All right. So even if we are up there with the Lord, we're not, you know, gallivanting around heaven. We're not driving our big Cadillacs or hanging out in the mansion or any of that stuff. We are waiting to be resurrected so we can get our new body. So that's perhaps the, the best case scenario as far as being with the Lord, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? People who take that hard stance, which I don't, um, so I, I definitely lean much more on the, the sleep side. And frankly, I prefer that because uh, it's just like, you know, going into uh, uh, into surgery, right? When they put you out, you're out, <laughs> right? And then you wake up, you're like, wait, uh, you know, when are you going to get started? Well, we're already done, right? You were out for five hours, right? But you don't recognize it because you're, well, you're not conscious, right? So when you're dead, you're definitely not conscious uh, in, that, in that sense. So I'm good with that. I'm good with uh, closing my eyes at death and then not opening them until I get my new body. I'm totally fine with that. I hope that's the, the case. Uh, but if not, then I will be a disembodied spirit under the altar waiting for that new body. But I think the first is definitely the better option. That's that's my opinion. <laughs> okay. Uh, very good. Um Let's see. Okay, I answered the rest of uh, Carol's question there. Uh, this is from Justin. As in the days of Noah, so much of the earth was corrupted by this logic. How much of our food has been modified? Would it such practices be an abomination? Genetic manipulation leading to transhumanism, proprietary information, cross-pollinating a non-GMO crop, creating legal theft by patent infringement lawsuits, etc. Well, Justin, I, I think you I think you have a valid point. Um, you know, whether or not uh, genetic man manipulation of, of our food source falls into that same category, uh, I think is probably a little bit of a, a subjective um, perspective. 
but uh, I see what you're saying. And, uh, you know, I think anytime we start messing around with, with genetics, it could lead to serious trouble. Um, not that I'm against it entirely. Uh, I'm all for science. I'm all for progress. So it's a challenging one. I, I guess that's maybe my, my best answer. All right. This is from Alan. Uh, hi, Doug. Could you clarify, is the abomination of desolation the start of the tribulation or at 3.5 years? When did the two witnesses show up regarding this? All right, uh, Alan. So part of the, the challenge I, I suspect that you're facing here is who you're talking to and the terminology and probably some inconsistency in the nomenclature. And um, I get it, right? Because it's a little bit challenging. So technically, the great tribulation is only 3.5 years, right? Why is that called the great tribulation? Because that's when it gets nasty, okay? That's when it gets super ugly. How do we know that? Because we're told this in Revelation chapter 12 that uh, the angel, I mean, uh, Satan is cast out, okay? The, the accuser of the brethren has, has been cast down, right? Uh, the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time, right? So the dragon, uh, when you, when the dragon saw that he'd been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings and then she was, she went away for, you know, 1,260 days or 40 months, uh, time, times and a half a time. Okay, so that is when it gets bad. Now, before that, it was bad. But it wasn't that bad, okay? It was moderately okay. But the two witnesses are on the earth, and we see in chapter 11, it says, uh, leave the court out, which is outside the temple. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. They will tread the Holy City underfoot for 42 months. And I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they'll prophesy 1,260 days, right? Which is 42 months, which is... Time, times, and half a time, or 3.5 years. Okay, so these have the power to shut heaven, and it's going to be a pretty ugly time on planet Earth, okay? Now, notice here, this is why I am absolutely convinced that we have to have a seven-year period. Now, uh, my my good friend, uh, Scott Harwell, he, he thinks that's not the case. Hey, God bless him, okay? Uh, God bless him, and we're all allowed to have our differences of opinion, all right? But the reason that I think that we... We definitely have a seven-year period. I don't see how we can get around that because we have these two witnessing for 42 months or 12, 60 days. All right, that's very clear. And then when they are killed, uh, by, by who? They're going to be killed by the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. It's going to make war against them and kill them, right? So... There you go. He's going to come up. When does that happen? I would argue that happens around the time of the abomination of desolation. All right. And then uh, and and so when this happens, right, they're going to they're going to be dead and everyone's going to be really excited for three and a half days. Their bodies are not going to be put into graves. And guess what? Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another. Because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. All right. And then after three and a half days, they come back and everyone's pretty shaken up about this. Okay. So that's why I think we really have to have a period of seven years, three and a half years. At the beginning, the two prophets are coming. The two prophets are coming and their goal is to do what? Is it to terrorize the planet? No. Their goal is to get mankind to repent. Why? Because judgment is coming. Jonah was sent to Nineveh, right? Now, he wanted them to, to get it. Right? He wanted them to, to be judged. But that wasn't God's intention. God's intention was for them to repent, which they did. Um, and the two witnesses coming, the goal is for humanity to repent. We know that they're not going to do that because God tells us that mankind in general is not going to repent. But that doesn't mean he's not going to send the two witnesses anyway. He's still going to send them because he still wants humanity to repent. That is the big point here is that mankind would turn 
from their evil ways, right? It's not going to happen, but that is ultimately the goal. So I say the two witnesses have three and a half years where they're doing stuff. Yes, they are bringing some judgments on the earth, but with the, with the intention that man would turn from his sin. Notice also uh, in, um, let's see, it's in chapter nine. Let me go to chapter nine, because notice what it says. And it says, and they did not repent of their murders or their sorcerers or their sexual morality or their thefts, right? So mankind doesn't repent, but that's what God wants is he wants them to repent. And that is the purpose of the two witnesses. And then when the beast comes up, he finally finds a way to, uh, in my scenario, he's going to merge with Satan and he's going to have the authority and the, and the power to overcome these two. And then he'll kill them. And then from there on out, you know, after he kills them and he says, look, I'm God and he's shown himself to be God. Then you have 3.5 years of when it gets really ugly. That's when we we roll out the mark of the beast. That's when heads start to roll, like lots of them. <laughs> okay, and this is when you have the widespread persecution of the saints that we see in both Revelation and the book of Daniel. Um, and, and saints isn't only church people, right? But it, it's anybody who is in the commonwealth of Israel. That really is what the holy ones or the saints is talking about there. All right, uh, this is from Tyler. The Bible says, if you're a male and have long hair, it's a disgrace. Why did John have long hair? Wouldn't it have been unholy? Um, well, okay, let's be fair. You know, how long does your hair have to be for it to be long? Uh, you know, do you need a uh, crew cut? Is anything longer than a crew cut? Was that short hair, long hair, right? So there's definitely some subjectivity in that. Um, so I, I don't think it's necessarily wrong. There's certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's less common for a man to have longer hair, but again, how long is long? Absalom had apparently pretty long hair. Uh, was it as long as a woman, a woman's hair? We don't know, right? We're not told exactly. Did it come down to his shoulders and then he cut it? Did it go beyond that? You know, again, how long is long? That's, one of the questions that uh, we have to ask ourselves, and I don't know that we have the answer. Um, but, you know, when I see um, a man with long hair, as long as what I might expect on a woman, sometimes I'm kind of surprised. Okay. And, um, well, I'm going to leave it there. Okay. Because I think we can't really, uh, I think we can't really answer that 100%. Um, Okay, so the question is, can you speak on Acts 10, 10 through 15? Thanks. Sure. Okay, let's go to Acts 10. And verse 10. All right. So uh, Peter falls into a trance and he saw heaven open. He got all kinds of four-footed creatures. God says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He says, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision, which he had seen meant, behold, the men who were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked for the Simon whose surname was Peter was lodging there. Okay, so three times this thing comes down, and guess what? Three guys show up, okay? Now, let's let Peter, rather than give my interpretation, I want to give you Peter's interpretation of Peter's dream, okay? So, Peter's interpretation of Peter's dream. I think that's the best way to go about it. Okay, so uh, here comes Peter. He says, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. Well, scripture doesn't actually say that. Peter had a major bias against anybody who was not Jewish. So he gave Peter this dream to shake him up. Look what Peter says. It's not my words. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So now look back here in verse 15. Where God is cleansed, you must not call common. 
So what was Peter calling common? Was it food or was it, well, should I say certain animals or was it actually man? I should not call any man common or unclean. So that is Peter's interpretation of Peter's dream, right? I don't think I could do any better than that. So that's the answer. Peter saying the dream was all about me calling people unclean, right? And that's what God had to do to really shake Peter up to get his attention. All right, this is from uh, Tomas, Tomas, I don't know, Tomas, yeah, Tomas Rodriguez. Okay, my question is in Judges 11, verse 30 to 40, it says Jephthah said he would sacrifice the first thing he sees come from his home. Why was his only daughter allowed to be sacrificed? Well, Thomas, um, <laughs> the book of Judges is a book of screw-ups, okay? And uh, the, the Bible is pretty amazing that way. And it gives us the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, All right? So we know that everybody was doing what was right in his own eyes. We know that there was no king in Israel, right? So the, the book of Judges is really setting us up to say, you know what? Israel needed a king because it was pretty bad. And eventually that king is going to be King David, right? In the book of Samuel. Well, in Ruth, of course, we have the background, the genealogical background to King David. That's a beautiful story in the book of Ruth. And then we have 1 Samuel which is, uh, the you know, God raising up Samuel. Then the people saying, we want a king. So then God says, okay, fine, I'll give you Saul. And uh, he had some successes and then some failures. And then it leads, of course, to King David, right? So that's what that is all about. But the whole thing about judges is, you know, they were doing some pretty crazy stuff. So it's possible, it's possible that Jephthah, you know, had a substitute and he didn't actually kill his daughter and that maybe she spent her days as a virgin. That's a possibility, but I think it's probably the lesser of the options. I think because people were doing what was right in their own eyes and they weren't thinking very much and they didn't even think about, they didn't know the Torah. If they'd known the Torah, the law, they, they would have known, Jephthah would have known that there was a way he could have just paid a ransom for a person, right? That's what he was supposed to do. But it seems that he probably didn't, and he wanted to keep his oath to God. And so he did the unthinkable, which was human sacrifice. And that's simply one more reason that they kind of needed a king because they weren't doing so hot. Uh, that's that's kind of the, the point there. All right. Uh, this is from Tyler. Brother Doug, I know you and Brother Rob believe Nimrod will be the beast. In the Bible, the son of perdition is referred to as Judas, John 17, 12. Do you think it's the same spirit or two different? So it's a great question. So I, I'm not 100% convinced that Nimrod, the man, right, the guy that lived way back then is going to be the same guy that's going to arise in the last times, the last days. What I would suggest is the same genetic uh, transformation that Nimrod underwent so that if he, he became this son of perdition will happen to the beast in the future, right? So that's kind of a technical answer, right? Um, it's not, you know, simple and, and pretty, but, but that's more or less how I see it. Why is Judas called the son of perdition? Well, Satan entered into him. Judas was willing to let Satan take over his body and do his work. So in that sense, he became the son of perdition. Uh, I would argue that Nimrod and the beast uh, did and will undergo a transformation that's even more extreme than what Judas experienced simply by being possessed. So I think Nimrod and the beast are definitely going to be possessed, but I also think it will lead to a genetic transformation uh, in their very DNA, all right? And maybe that began to set in with Judas. I'm only speculating, uh, but I think there's at least a, a real possibility, okay? All right, um, this is from Thomas or Thomas. Uh, Pastor, are you going to see The Chosen in theaters this week? I didn't know that it was in theaters this week. Uh, it's a great, it's a great uh, story. So 
I don't know. Maybe I'll have to look into that. But uh, I, I, I watched season one of The Chosen. I thought it was really well done. Um, it is, you know, it's historical fiction. That's the basic idea, right? So it's not supposed to be the Bible precisely done, but it's uh, it's historical fiction. That's the idea. So, um, okay, this is uh, Jesus Loves You. You don't sleep till resurrection. I know because my mother, who was in a coma until she woke up, told me she was chosen, went home, and I know exactly where her escort was standing at the time. Okay, well, very cool. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> um, let's see. I like your old authentic background more. I think it shows more personality. Well, thank you. Um, appreciate that. Uh, just making some some changes to the set. So I'm going to go with this for a while, but maybe I'll get a different one eventually. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, I do appreciate that. Let's see. Um, maybe there's one more here. Uh, I hate tattoos. I don't understand why some Christians get them. What verses are there other than we are the temple of the Most High? Thank you. Um, well, so it talks about not tattooing your body for the sake of the dead. So I'm not in favor of tattoos either, but I'm not persuaded that they are absolutely forbidden. I think they're forbidden uh, if you do it in memory of the dead. I don't think you're supposed to do that, just as you're not supposed to shave your beard in memory of the dead. But I don't have a beard because I didn't shave it for somebody who's dead. I just don't keep a beard. Uh, and there are people in this world who don't even have facial hair. So if you have to have facial hair in order to be a good Christian, there are many people who just simply can't do it. Right. So on that same logic, I don't think uh, that it's it's I don't think it's wrong to get a tattoo. I'm, I don't encourage them. I think it's a bad idea, but I, I'm not absolutely positive that scripture is saying you cannot do this in any under any circumstance. I think it's saying that, you know, if, uh, if you're going to do this on behalf of maybe a dead cult or somebody who recently died, you shouldn't do that. Just as you shouldn't shave your beard for those same reasons. All right. Very good. Um, okay. I think I got them all. Thank you, guys. Love your questions. As always, they're fantastic. Uh, again, please come with us to Israel in April 2024. Go to thewaycongregation.com to get more information about that. Get the app. You're going to love it. It's got lots of cool stuff on it. And you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Doug Hamp. And you can give uh, as whatever's on your heart. Thank you so much. Until